Um, thanks, folks, for, for coming. Um, today, I want to talk about a, um, a book that I uh, wrote. It's 574 pages. I'm going to try to summarize it in, in uh, 15 minutes here. And what I tried to do in the, the book was to take advantage of, a, of a, a trend lately in chimpanzee studies. You all know that, that we've been studying chimpanzees. Goodall herself has been studying chimpanzees for, for over 60 years. So we know a lot about their physiology, about their, from captivity, about their social behavior. We've known about their anatomy since the first good anatomical study was published in 1699. So we know a lot about chimpanzees. We understand what's unique about them. We can describe practically every aspect of their lives and their anatomy, but only recently have a number of us be begun to try to, to stretch out from the first few links we made between traits of chimpanzees and try to, to link everything um, in order to understand the organism as, as a whole. And by doing that, we, we can apply that to other species. And, the species I'm interested in applying it to are, is, is our species in our own lineage. I'm interested in understanding, especially the evolution of, of bipedalism. So when we look at chimpanzees, um, it, it sometimes it's lost in their resemblance to monkeys in being furry and not having a tall forehead and so on, that they share a lot of traits with, with humans. And one of those is mobile shoulders. They can reach their, their arm directly above their head um, as, as humans can. It's something very unusual among animals. You couldn't do this with your pet, cat, or, or dog. They have dexterous fingers, although their thumbs are small, so they don't use opposability that much. But they also have um, good wrist rotation, which again is an unusual thing. So if you look at this infant um, here, you might be able to see that her palm is facing backwards. So they have that ability to pronate and supinate or rotate um, the wrist. Their teeth are almost indistinguishable from, from ours. Um, their cusps are low and, and rounded in, in stark contrast to monkeys that have a sort of a hacksaw um, shaped or ridged, uh, very sharp um, teeth. Their brains, while they're smaller compared to, to humans, um, one of my, my neuroanatomy colleagues um, says about their brains that they're human brains in miniature. Um, all the, the different areas of the brain are quite similar in, in size and in function uh, to that of, of humans. They share with us something that people don't appreciate um, very much when we talk about ourselves as omnivores, and that is antifeedant intolerance. So I'm gonna mention antifeedants a lot. Um, most of that is poisons, but fiber also counts as, as an antifeedant. It's things that, that keep animals from feeding um, on, on plants. They have a slow life history. In other words, it takes them a long time to, to grow up. So all the animals in this, this picture are three years old, the horse, the human, and the chimpanzee. Um, you can see that in size and in maturity, the chimpanzee is much more like a human than it is like a horse. You run the Kentucky Derby as a, as a three-year-old. Um, chimpanzees are one of the very, very few animals that experience sleep paralysis. Um, they are absolutely incapable of movement during some parts of the, the sleep, during some sleep phases. And that's something they share with humans, but almost no other animals, very few other animals um, have that. They have excellent memories. In fact, um, in, in some ways, their memories are superior to humans, but in many ways, they're, they're quite equivalent, although not precisely the same. They can remember individuals that they know both to recognize them and they remember their history with that, their personality traits of these um, individuals and who those individuals have interacted with. They remember the location of objects extremely well. Um, if something's hidden from them that they want, like a, a piece of food, they can remember for not just hours, but days where that thing is, is located. They have the capacity for mind reading. And this is something sort of, sort of odd, but by, by looking at gestures and um, facial expressions and looking at the context that another individual is in, they can guess what that individual is thinking in a way that's very similar to humans. We can't exactly read minds, but you can tell the emotional state of, of another individual, whether they feel uncomfortable because they're being dishonest or something like that. That's something we share with chimpanzees and not many other animals. Monkeys can't do it. 
chimpanzees naturally turn to tools when they face um, a task that they can't accomplish well using their hands or, or teeth. So next to humans, they're the most tool using animal and they use a wide variety of tools in many different contexts for many different tasks. And they're capable of creating new tools on the fly if they have to. They use what knowledge they have about tools to solve problems in a way that's, that's distinctly inferior, unlike their memory, distinctly inferior to humans, but still um, very, very impressive. They have an instinctual fear of strangers and hatred of strangers. And this is why they can't really be pets. When they encounter individuals they don't know, they're very uncomfortable. And there have been many unfortunate cases of chimpanzees, especially males, females too, but males in particular fear and are aggressive toward strangers. Despite that, chimpanzees are extraordinarily social. They, uh, so there's, there's a contrast when it comes to individuals from other communities, strangers, they're very aggressive and you could call that antisocial. But within the community, they're very tightly bonded and recognize one another as individuals in their own um, history. They're so social that unlike many other animals, if you confine them solitarily um, in, in a captive situation, they become depressed and many of them die um, very, very quickly. They certainly don't, aren't psychologically normal. So they have these, these instincts um, of fear and hatred of strangers, an instinct toward sociality that's, that's very um, intriguing. They also have a compulsion to make a nest. So there is a chimpanzee in a nest in the wild, but if you keep them in captivity, even if they've never seen another chimpanzee make a nest, if they have materials they can make a nest of in their cage, they will make a nest as this chimpanzee at the Lincoln Park Zoo has done from this Excelsior. So they, they, it, they don't have to be taught this. This is, is an instinct. When something exciting happens, um, they um, tend to, to pant hoot, or when they see um, an individual that they, they find interesting or that they, they know well, they tend to engage in this vocalization that you've, that you've heard. Um, I won't do the whole thing, but you know, I won't go all full Jane Goodall on you, but um, they, it, it's uh, that vocalization that starts with hoo, 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 and it ends differently according to, to what they're doing. Sometimes they're just telling other chimps, this is me, I'm here. And the other chimps can hear them and know where they are because they recognize their voices. Their, their pant hoot is different if they discover food and they wanna tell other chimps that they're at a place where there's a lot of food. So when the pant hoot ends, it often end, it sort of winds down. And if they're just saying, here I am, it winds down with it sort of, oh, oh. If they're with food, it winds down a little differently. Oh, oh, oh. Um, and that tells other chimps that they're, they're with food. They're different from, from humans in this ability to, to grasp things with their hind foot. So that's a foot, not a hand of a, of a chimpanzee. And they have among the, the most powerful grips and the widest distance between the big toe and the, the um, second toe of, of um, any primate. So they can grasp something about the size of a soda can extremely effectively. And it turns out, this was my dissertation research, that the, the branches that they like to climb on, the tr tree trunks that they like to climb on, are about the diameter of a, of a soda can. They have long fingers and long arms, especially from the elbow to the tip of the fingers. Their whole arm is long, but it stretches out more in the forearm and with the fingers. And as you can see, their thumb isn't quite as big as ours. And with their long fingers, they end up manipulating things a little more with their fingers than using opposability in contrast to us. When they walk around, they do something that's very unusual. You've seen it in gorillas, but um, also chimpanzees, not, not other animals. They um, fold their fingers up in, into a, a bit of a fist, although you can see that they've extended this, the uh, most, the joint um, between the fingers and the palm. And we call this the knuckle walking uh, posture. So this is how they, they get around. They have large ears. This is something that I find intriguing that I've, I've speculated about. You'll hear about that in just a second. 
um, compared to gorillas, orangutans, baboons, um, humans, their, their ears are quite um, large. Compared to monkeys, now those things, I was comparing them to, to humans, although many of those things apply to monkeys as well. Compared to monkeys, they also have long fingers and arms. They also engage in knuckle walking, which, which monkeys don't. And they have mobile shoulders and a, a broad thorax that, that so that they have shoulders like humans, and that makes them look very, very human-like. But I think the most um, interesting comparison, and certainly the one that has the longest evolutionary history, is body size. The very first 25 million years ago, um, apes that, that we have um, in the fossil record were much bigger than monkeys that existed at the same time. Their bodies looked a lot like monkeys then, but their body size was much um, larger. So chimpanzees eat a lot of different food items. At Mahali, for instance, they ate 300 different food items. But even though they eat a wide variety of foods, the foods they eat tend to be, are almost always, unless they're starving, low in fiber and low in poisons. Monkeys can tolerate fiber and poisons. But chimpanzees are just like you and me. They have the same food preferences and the same things are poisonous to them and the same things um, are not poisonous um, to them. So chimps are finicky eaters, but monkeys are less finicky. And remember I talked about antifeedins. Monkeys are antifeedin tolerant. They can deal with these poisons. They have specialized enzymes that, that um, bond with them and so that they can be um, um, filtered out of the blood by the kidneys and expelled. Humans and chimps are not antifeedin um, tolerant. So um, this allows them to, to, to deal with the antifeedins that are found in plants. Plants are protecting themselves with these antifeedins. Um, they um, have these, these chemicals in their leaves, poisons, um, that, that serve to, to prevent um, animals from eating their body parts. So they're abundant in, in leaves, but they're also abundant in unripe fruit. So monkeys can eat leaves and unripe fruit and flowers. Flowers often have poisons in them too. Those are the genitals of plants. And so plants protect those often. Um, so uh, monkeys can eat flowers, um, leaves and, and unripe fruits and, and chimps um, can't. So we, when this, is, this was um, work I did during my, my postdoc that we published in 1991, there I am. Um, monkeys often eat unripe fruit. About half of the fruit they eat is unripe. And then they, this is just fruit. They eat a lot of leaves. Um, chimpanzees hardly eat any leaves. They do eat some, um, but when they eat fruit, it's almost all ripe um, fruit. So the, the chimpanzee optimal diet, the one that allows them to grow properly, to, to reproduce, um, to be able to live their most active life, to be healthy, is one that has lots of fats, oils, and sugars um, in it, but doesn't have a lot of, of fiber and poison. So um, this with olive oil and sugar uh, being those concentrated, but here are items that, that they might um, be more likely to, to eat. That is the diet that chimpanzees are trying to get. And when these things are available, that's, that's what they, they eat. So when we look at those, now I want to begin to sort of describe how the adaptations that I've talked about, the unique things that make a chimpanzee a chimpanzee, um, in, integrate into their adaptation to the environment. The chimpanzee molars are engineered to burst open succulent ripe fruits, to squeeze their, their juice squeezers, um, and then they squash up these fruits to make them more easily um, digestible. Monkey teeth, that, that sort of sawtooth, sharp cusped look that you see in, in monkeys are meant to, to slice up into a fine gruel um, tough things like leaves and unripe fruit. If you've ever eaten an unripe banana, you know that it's, um, that it's uh, very tough and crunchy. This is what um, the, their teeth are, are evolved to do. And that means that the anti-tolerant monkeys with their specialized teeth and um, ability to detoxify poisons can get to, to fruit earlier than, than chimpanzees um, can. So, they, they go to trees when the roots to, uh, fruit's still unripe. They um, eat the things that are easiest to get to and leave a hollow sphere of, of fruits out among the, the twigs at the edges of, of the tree. So chimpanzees have to get to that fruit, but they have large bodies. And that 
makes it difficult for them to sit on these tiny branches. The branches just bend and toss them out of the tree. So with their large bodies and with the fruit out at the edge, they have evolved to be able to, their mobile shoulders, their long fingers to be able to reach around branches no matter what size there are. The, their long arms and flexible shoulders help them to, to arm hang um, or hang feed as some people call it um, out in the, the edges of, of the branches. So um, with their anti feed tolerance, monkeys are able to find fruit in about every other tree that they, they pass through between the flowers, leaves, both ripe and mostly unripe fruit. There's more unripe fruit in the forest than there is ripe um, fruit. So they, it, it's worth it for them, since they're only passing through maybe one tree that has no food, to just leap from tree to tree, even though that's difficult. But for chimpanzees, it's, it's not worth it because unripe fruit is rare and highly dis dispersed. So it, they have to travel a long distance between trees that have, have fruits. So they don't have as much food um, and they exist in a much lower population um, density. Um, and as you can imagine, existing at that population density to gather enough food, they have to travel a lot farther um, than, than monkeys do. So while monkeys may um, pass through a, one tree without finding food, chimpanzees, instead of passing through five or 10, will come down to the, to the ground and walk on the ground. It's easier for them to do when, when fruits are, are far apart. So um, chimpanzees are evolved to be able to walk the long distances that it takes to find this dispersed and, and rare fruit. Chimps are not terribly efficient walkers compared to, to humans or animals that are specialized for walking like horses and dogs, but they're more efficient than the other apes um, because they walk a, a longer um, distance. So they've um, evolved this knuckle walking uh, morphology that enables them to walk effectively from, from place to, to place. So they, they walk between food sites that are quite distant, then they climb into the trees, then they make their way out to the edges of the trees where the fruits are found after monkeys have eaten the, the things that are easiest to eat when you're sitting, and then they hang feed or arm hang um, among the, the tree edge branches that are, that are usually um, tiny. So their long fingers, mobile wrists, you can see that this female, Pulin, her name is, uh, palm is facing backwards. So they need that flexibility to be able to, to feed effectively by rotating their body and by to adapting the, their hand posture to whatever branches are available. They need a gripping great toe um, and you can see this branch is about the size of a soda can, uh, the, the stem of this tree. Um, they need that to, to um, aid in climbing. And then their, their long fingers um, help them to, to climb and also help them to, to arm hang. But those long fingers are clumsy on the ground when you want to walk. And that's why they need the long fingers for mostly for arm hanging, but also for climbing. Um, but to, to walk efficiently, they fold them up a little bit and walk on this middle joint of, of the hand, knuckle walking. Avoiding poisons um, allows big brains to grow. It turns out that, that poisons interferes with neurogenesis and um, cell division. And so the brain is an extremely sensitive organ to, to poisons. So avoiding po poisons um, allows you to have a, a larger brain. It makes it less expensive to grow a larger brain. But big brains have costs. In addition to the energy it takes to, to grow them, um, they um, have to be repaired and recharged at, um, occasionally. And that's what sleep is, is all about. So having a big brain slows down because you, you can't um, devote too much energy to just the brain alone when you're, when you're growing. Um, it slows down growth because so much energy is, is channeled. Um, to it, and then it requires um, sleep. Their odd diet of chimpanzees has another consequence, a social consequence that is unexpected, and we didn't understand this for, for many years. Females tend to be solitary. That's on the left there, uh, Fifi chimpanzee that you may have heard of with Flossie on her back and Fanny following behind, um, alone except for with their kids. 
males tend to, to gather in, in groups. And we understand why females are, are solitary now. It's a, a bit of a surprise, but what we found is that when, um, and, and we knew this, um, but, but we didn't understand exactly how it, it um, interfered with female sociality. When, when you're in a group, feeding is more expensive because you spend, you, you feed less efficiently. You spend more time on things like competing with other individuals, grooming them, um, changing feeding site because a dominant individual has come and, and forced you to move out of the feeding site. So feeding rate goes down the larger the group is, and it goes down faster for females than it does for males because males are not gentlemen. Um, they take what food they want and they'll move a female out of a feeding site that they want with, without a second thought. So females can't afford to, to be in groups as, as males can because they have other sorts of, of demands on, their, uh, on their, their energy. They have to, to feed too. They're, they're nursing infant and themselves. And so they have to focus on, on food. So you can imagine that this other um, travel cost of, of feeding, if let's say an individual has to travel a kilometer to find enough food to eat. If she wants to travel with a friend, then the two of them to find the same amount of food, they have to keep moving after they've stripped all the trees of the food they can find uh, as they go along. So they have to move a couple of kilometers. It's not exactly a one-to-one -one ratio, but close. Three individuals will have to go three kilometers and, and so on. So um, that makes traveling with other individuals um, very expensive. And because moms are, are eating for two, um, females tend to, to settle into a small area where they can learn exactly where all the food is, where they don't have to travel very far, and where they can avoid males and find food um, very e efficiently. They don't want to be with males. Um, they want to be alone because males will kick them out of the best um, feeding sites. One of the reasons that chimpanzees have such wonderful memories is that they need to remember where all these medium and small food sites are. Monkeys travel in groups. They never break down into these small subgroups like chimpanzees um, do. So you can rely on some other individuals knowing where the food is, and you can take a, a, a route daily that goes through, or almost daily, that goes through uh, a place where you can expect to find food. That's how chimpanzees um, do it. They memorize where all the medium and large food su supply places are, but also some small ones uh, as well. And females have to do that on their own. They can't rely on another individual in their group to remember where the food is. Males can sometimes rely on, on other individuals. So females know their core area, the place where they settle in, a permanent area a couple kilometers across that they live in for their entire lives once they've reached maturity, they don't defend this core area. It overlaps with other females and they run into females occasionally. Um, it's not a territory in other words, but um, they're, they're mostly alone in, in that because other females have memorized food supplies in other core areas that are, that are near, nearby. So this geographic stability has a consequence and um, it's a consequence of, of uh, the, the consequences that males are um, selected to be territorial and then to be violent. So I, I talked about interconnectivity. Um, so one of the things that we can say now, and, and I'm developing this as we, as we go along, you can probably begin to see the connection that chimpanzee um, digestive physiology causes them to be violent. The fact that they have to eat ripe fruit, they're dependent on ripe fruit, affects their dispersion in, in uh, the habitat, and that causes females to be asocial, not to, to live in groups, and then it, it um, inspires males um, to be territorial. So if a male could guard a territory, walk around this territory, guarding it, ex excluding every male, um, closely watching um, which individuals are in the group, he would have reproductive access to, to all the females that are in, in the area. Of course, he'd have to walk a long distance. It would be very difficult um, for him. So you don't find single males. Actually, this is the orangutan um, social system. But for chimpanzees, because they can move faster on the ground, um, they can, can, instead of having a single individual, 
they can have a number of individuals. So if a male were attempting to guard this number of females and he had a competitor, um, that competitor, of course, would be attempting to exclude him from, from the territory. But if he, he had a brother to help him, perhaps, or a nephew um, or an uncle, he could effectively guard that territory from that interloper that wants to, to come in. So what we find in, in chimpanzee society is females are in their core areas, mostly alone, males travel together, and the number of males in the group rises until it becomes unmanageable. They have to walk too far to, to find um, food. They can't sustain bonds among a large number of individuals. And that number is about 10. It averages about 10 for chimpanzees. So males attempt to defend as large a territory as they can. And by having that large territory, they include a lot of females in it. And if they can expand the territory, even if there are no more females in it, they have more food for those females. And so that increases the success for the females. But if they're not good fighters, in other words, if they can't defend their territory, if the males don't effectively bond together and stand shoulder to shoulder against male interlopers, then the territory shrinks, the females have too little food, some of the females leave, other females can't reproduce or their infants die. It's a tragedy for the, for the um, community. So chimpanzees are motivated to defend aggressively with murderous killing violence their territories. They, in fact, benefit if they can kill um, individuals in neighboring communities because then they have fewer competitors that, that might threaten their territory. So um, unlike monkeys, chimpanzees try to kill um, members of, of um, other groups. It's, in fact, chimpanzees are possibly, we, we haven't studied the insects well enough to, to say this for certain, um, and there are some other animals, but among the mammals, they're certainly the most violent um, of, of animals. Monkeys aren't like this, and monkeys have um, fewer challenges to their, to their food supply, and that affects their, their social group. Because they can switch from unripe fruit to ripe fruit, to leaves, to flowers, to other sorts of, of things, um, they have a lot of flexibility in their food. Chimps are finicky eaters, monkeys not so much. That flexibility means that their food supply is relatively constant because chimps are dependent on ripe fruit and ripe fruit runs out. It's not there on the trees very long and you're competing with other animals. The, the food supply varies dramatically uh, for chimpanzees and there's always a, a, a threat of them um, starving. So the, the consequence of this so, so for monkeys, they stay in groups all the time. They, they never split up. The same individuals are there day after day, week after week. For chimpanzees, when the food supply drops, because feeding efficiency goes down in groups, they, they tend to split up into smaller groups. I've made these single individuals. Males don't like to be completely alone, but they'll break into smaller groups. Um, if there's a lot of food, then they combine in larger groups. So they fission or split, when there's little food, fuse or um, um, undergo fusion whenever there's, there's a lot of um, food. So um, they have a, a strategy um, for staying in as large a group as, as possible. When one individual discovers a tree with a lot of uh, fruit in it, he calls other individuals um, to, to that tree. So he sees there's fruit. And how does he do that? How does he tell individuals that they're there? He does it with a pant hoot, with that peculiar pant hoot that I, I showed you. He finds this tree, mostly it's a male, because females are going to stay in their core areas unless that tree happens to be in or extremely near their core area. So mostly males are coming um, to this tree, but some females will, will come as, as well. Um, he pant hoots and lets them know. So why do chimpanzees have these odd ears? Um, it's like an old fashioned ear trumpet the large ears help to accumulate um, sound um, better. So chimpanzee can hear these faint calls of pant hoots miles away um, in a way that, that you and I um, can't. So very, very few animals have this sort of fission fusion society that breaks up into smaller groups and gathers in larger groups when, they're, when there's more um, food. This exerts a, a very unusual selective pressure 
on uh, chimpanzees. That's a curtain there and a chimpanzee peering around it. Um, chimpanzees have a society where many things happen, what I call off stage. They don't see a lot of social um, events because they're gathering in these small subgroups, something social, something interesting is going on in each of these subgroups. Social ranks may be changing, individuals may be becoming friends that were enemies and, and so on. Monkeys don't have this sort of selective pressure because they never fission. They stay together all the time. They can do that because their food supply is more, is more constant. So chimpanzees need to be able, when one individual enters a group, to read the mental state of the individuals that are in that group, to see if his allies are still allies to him or see if his enemies have changed, see if one of his allies has, has broken up with them, so to speak, and is now uh, formed a close bond with, with one of his enemies. Those things are all important to chimpanzees in a way that they're not uh, for other animals. And so chimpanzees are selected to be able to read these subtle cues in a way that's very similar to humans. So we humans can do that um, quite, a, quite good um, as well. So um, food supply, because fruiting trees tend to fruit at different times in different places and they're exhausted earlier in some places, group size varies from, from place to place. At the same time that one community might be um, watched with, with uh, fruit and gathered in large groups, another community might have very little food and they fission into these very small groups. So chimpanzees experience something that monkeys don't. They have an imbalance of power. They have a large, in, in essence, a large group in one community and a small group in another. And that means that they can use this imbalance of power to, to kill chimpanzees in, in neighboring uh, communities. They can do this because if they are in numbers of, of four or five, there's almost no chance that they could be injured if they're attacking a single individual. Um, that poor individual though is, is doomed if he's caught by these four or five um, individuals. And we've actually studied this and find, found that the, the more individuals that attack, the fewer injuries any individual um, receives and often they receive no in, in injuries whatsoever, but they kill the individual that they attack. And what are the benefits of killing the, a male in a neighboring community? That community's defenders are weaker then. Um, you can expand your territory. You have more food for the individuals in your group. A female may come and join that group. Males that are good at defending their territory, um, taking advantage of this imbalance of power have great reproductive um, success. So I think, um, looking back at the fossil record and in my book, I, I talked about this, that the very first adaptation of, of apes was to have large uh, body size. And they did that so that they could exclude monkeys from, from feeding trees. Back when, 25 million years ago, monkeys didn't have this anti-feeding tolerance. They had teeth, in other words, the, the, the reason we think this is they had teeth that looked almost exactly like chimpanzees, good for crushing ripe fruit. Apes were larger and then monkeys immediately began to evolve different teeth and presumably different um, uh, digestive abilities. So monkeys evolved anti feedant tolerance in response to the large body size that the chimps evolved. So chim chimpanzees kept their, their primitive digestive physiology it's monkeys who are specialized anti feedant tolerant um, animals that, that um, have, have a very specific um, uh, niche in, in their in environment. One of the consequences of large body size is that you can afford a bigger brain. If you only weigh a few ounces, adding an ounce to your brain is impossible. If you only weigh a couple pounds, adding an ounce to your brain is impossible. But if you weigh 110 pounds like a chimpanzee, adding an ounce or two a brain is not so expensive. So one of the things that having a large body size does is it frees you up to have a larger brain. So early apes 25 million years ago did not have larger brains, but they had larger bodies. And I think one of the reasons they were free to, they had selective pressure to, to be smarter because of this fission fusion social system eventually um, when they evolved that. But um, they were free to evolve those larger brains because in part because of their larger body size and because they, they weren't ingesting poisons that interfere with, 
with brain um, growth. So that's the, the first bit where we've been able to talk about some of the specializations of, of chimpanzees. We've gradually over the, the, the last um, 50, 75 years, been linking some of these characteristics to, to one another. But lately, um, I and some of my colleagues have tried to, to have a more global um, uh, linking of, of the, the various unique traits of, of chimpanzees. And that's what I've done in, in this book to try to present all these unique things and then show how they're linked um, together. And the core of this is, as you might expect from everything I've said before, their anti-feed intolerance. Everything else grows out of this anti feedant intolerance and their competition with, with monkeys. So um, they, they can't eat fiber and, and poison. And so their optimal diet list is mostly ripe fruit. They're, if they can't get to ripe fruit, they can't, they can't survive. And ripe fruit, because fruit is, is unripe for a much longer period of time, and because monkeys are eating that fruit and other animals as well, um, bats and, and squirrels and, and um, uh, birds of, of, of different sorts, they're, they're all eating this fruit at the same time. So as, as the fruit ripens every day, a few more are taken by other animals. So um, that dependence on ripe fruit means that their food is dispersed widely and there's not very, very much of it. And that means that the chimpanzees and other apes too, um, but, but chimpanzees live at a low population density. And that also means that they have to walk a long way um, to, to get to the, the food that they need in order to, to survive. And that um, optimal diet list, which, which um, makes their food dispersed and results in a low population density and uh, feeding competition means that females settle into these core areas and are not um, very very social. They can't stand, they can't tolerate the long day ranges, the long walks it would take to travel in groups in addition to the competition for, for food. So in, in the end, this, this intolerance of anti feedants results in females being asocial or, or, or solitary. Because they need to be able to, to find food effectively and there's not very much of it, they memorize food supplies in a small area and they end up settling into a poor area for their entire life. And when they're stationary like this, given that males have low travel costs already because they have to travel on the ground, they can afford to get together in groups and patrol a large territory um, in order to exclude other males. But to do that, they have to, to be reliable allies if when another group of males attacks you, um, two of your males run and hide, you're, you're in bad shape. So males have to be strongly bonded to one another. And then there's an advantage to them protecting that territory with extreme aggression that includes um, violence. Their optimal diet list, because it's ripe fruit, um, the food supply fluctuates. Um, and because it's dispersed, that makes it um, even, even worse. Um, when the food supply fluctuates, the party size or, or subgroup size fluctuates. This is the fission fusion um, aspect of, of chimpanzee um, society. That um, fluctuation um, provides an imbalance of power at times. One time, uh, one community has a, the advantage in the imbalance of power. Other times, it's the other um, community. But it does create the imbalance of power, and that's what allows this, this lethal aggression to, to take hold, that you can safely, with four or five individuals, attack any single individual that you, that you find. But of course, you need to gather in groups. So how do you do that? When an individual discovers a, a place where everybody can feed together, get their fill, and then march off to guard their territory, the pant who allows them um, to do that, to call one another um, to this. The, the long day ranges, in combination with the the long fingers means that chimpanzees have to be able to, to, to deal with those long fingers as, as propulsive organs. And that's what the knuckle walking anatomy that we see in their hands um, is about. Females are alone a lot of the time. And that means they have to be able to, when almost whenever they run into males, that everything has occurred off stage. 
um, recently because they're solitary with just their, their kids. Um, but because party size fluctuates and often groups have fission into smaller groups, males have to deal with that as, as well. So both males and females have to be good at this mind reading and that requires um, a lot of intelligence. In addition to, to mind reading, chimpanzees have to remember where all their food is located and males have to remember where their, their territory boundary is and the, the history of other communities attacking. They have to remember where specific females are. They have close friends among the, um, the females. And so that spatial memory is important to, as um, well. Because males um, need to be able to guard their territory, they need that, that spatial um, memory. So advanced cognition is a combination of these offstage events, a, a consequence of the fission fusion uh, society, and the, the dispersion of chimpanzees that, that means that they've got to, got to be able to remember the location of food and the location of territorial boundaries. So um, they need large brains. And they have big bodies, so they can, they can um, afford those large brains. The large body size evolved because chimpanzees, I think, needed to, to um, compete effectively with, with monkeys. But um, so that, that specialization on fruit um, that comes from that anti feedings intolerance um, selected for the large body size of, of chimpanzees. The fruit that they find is out in those, those terminal branches. And with that large body size um, and the fruit being in those tiny twigs at the edge of the trees, means they need to have mobile shoulders and uh, rotatable wrists and uh, gripping fingers that are very powerful so that they can hang out there for minutes and minutes at a time gathering, gathering food. But having those long fingers, when they also need to have, be able to walk um, great, great distances, means that they have to have this knuckle walking um, anatomy. And then going back up here, if you can see, the sparse and dispersed food means that after walking, to the next feeding site, they need to be able to climb up into the tree. Monkeys just stay in the trees. Chimpanzees come to the ground and then climb um, back up. Large body size allows brains to be a little bigger as um, the diet um, does, does as well. Um, and then this anti-feeding in, in, intolerance means that cracking open nuts, nuts that are armored but don't have poison inside them. And being able to get at things like termites, which don't have poison, but guard themselves with a termite mound, all of those things that require tool use tend to, to allow chimpanzees to get at low poison, low fiber um, sorts of food. So those are, are related to anti-feeding intolerance and intelligence as well. But it takes a lot of energy to grow that big brain so the chimpanzees grow slowly. The big brain requires energy to recharge it um, and repair it during, during the night. So advanced cognition and big brains requires that chimpanzees sleep in a nest, unlike other animals, because they have sleep paralysis, they'd fall out of a tree if they slept like baboons, just balancing on a, a branch. So they need to be able to make nests. So all of these traits that we, um, 10 years ago even, uh, viewed as, as individual attributes of chimpanzees, we now link together in this huge web. And as you can imagine, it, it helps us when we need to deal with fossils or newly discovered um, species, um, because we can use this linkage and, and all the other information that we learned about chimpanzees as, as well. And that's what I wanna talk about in this last few minutes of, of the talk. So why are humans bipedal? Um, chimpanzees, I found in, in my um, research at both Gambi, Mahali, and where I'm working now, are bipedal when they collect small fruits from short trees. The, the fruits being small is a factor because if it were a big fruit, you just pluck it and sit down. But if they're small, you have to keep feeding them out. Um, if the tree is too tall, you can't reach any of the fruits from the ground by standing up. Um, and if the fruit is, is tall, it's often, if the tree is, is tall, Often there are some big branches where you can sit, but when the tree is small, all the fruits are found among tiny branches. You can't sit because they bend, but you can grip a branch with your toes and then balance your body above your hips, stabilize your body. This is exactly what chimps do in these tiny trees um, and then collect um, fruit with, with the other hand. 
if um, hominins were, were confined to a habitat with a lot of these short trees, then they, if they were, the pre-hominins were confined um, to that habitat, then they might evolve bipedalism as this sort of, sort of feeding um, posture. And it turns out we have a very good idea what sort of habitat Australopithecus were in. And in fact, many of the species that provoke bipedalism among chimpanzees are found, po the pollen of them, with Australopiths. So um, why did bipedalism evolve? Chimpanzees tells us that it might well be a feeding posture for gathering fruits in um, dry habitats. How do we know that they were eating fruits? Our teeth and the teeth of these fossils were very much like chimpanzees that eat fruit. Why are we smart? Well, weak digestive physiology leads to smart, uh, sparse dispersed foods. That leads to efficient fusion social system. That leads to imbalances of power. That leads to, leads to male alliance and patrolling. The fission fusion society requires mind reading and advanced cognition. And this allows political, chimps are political as well. I didn't talk about that. Um, a sort of social intelligence that, that is lacking in, in other, although primate, other primates are smart, but not as smart as chimpanzees. That leads to larger brains and a generalized intelligence that can also cope with tools and other aspects of advanced cognition. Then large group size um, also selects for um, intelligence. So um, those things um, suggest that, that the smart chimpanzees, that was our ancestral condition, but we went on to include more meat in our diet and finding meat requires an even larger home range than finding fruit. So we became, became even more fission-y, fusion -y. Our foods were even more um, sparse. We evolved larger societies that then became more uh, complex as we included individuals in our societies that we didn't see um, very often. And that required us to be really good mind readers um, and develop our social ability and our political ability. and. Um, larger body size, slightly larger, which allows larger brains. And we excluded even more poisons from our diet than chimpanzees um, do. Why do we use tools? Well, our food list is restricted by our digestive physiology and low anti-feeding foods tend to be protected by armor, by thick seed coats, so, um, or a, a termite mound, or um, a, a very aggressive animal that has meat that you wanna, want to eat, and those things all require um, tools. So they, they help us get access to low um, poison food. Why are we talkers? Well, fission fusion, fusion societies have off-stage aspects. Um, since no two individuals know the same thing, they may need to communicate that. So we call being able to, to talk about things that you can't see, either in the future or at a distance, displacement. So um, as, as a society becomes more and more fission-y and fusion-y, and there are more and more off-stage events, the value of language becomes greater and, and greater. If humans, by including meat um, and having larger day ranges in a more fission-y, fusion-y society, um, had the need for that, that greater communication, that may be why we evolved um, um, language. Why are we so warlike? Well, we have the same fission fusion imbalance of power situation as chimps, but we also lately accumulate resources. We've been doing that for um, many tens of thousands of years, but not back to our very beginning. So um, that, that inspires war as well. Why are we so particular about our diet? We can't deal with poisons and fiber doesn't provide us with, with any um, nutrition. Why are we weak? You probably know that chimpanzees are um, stronger than us for the same um, body weight. Um, we are, we're weak in the sense that we're not huge in comparison, males are not huge in comparison to females, like you see in orangutans or gorillas, because we rely, as chimpanzees do, on bonds among individuals that are warlike rather than, than on um, just individual power. But then we've also found, this is something we've just found in the last few years, that that um, uh, bodies can, can dedicate energy to either brains or, or muscles. And our bodies have been evolved to funnel that, that energy to brains rather than to muscles. And that makes us a little weaker pound per pound compared to chimpanzees. Why are we sexually dimorphic? Well, 
we're not that sexually dimorphic, um, but males engage much more often in intergroup conflict and females are involved much more often in acquiring resources for their infants because they nurse. Um, so those things put different selective pressures on males and females and make us look a little different, not as, as different as orangutans and gorillas, of course, but more different than, than say gibbons. Why are we slow to mature? We have really big uh, brains. Um, why are we social? Well, we're social for the same reason that, that chimpanzees are to form bonds to protect our interests. But um, as inner community conflict escalates, group size becomes more and more advantageous. So as we began to um, approve, to, to gather resources and guard them, um, larger group sizes were, were at um, an advantage. People often ask, this is my last thing here, people often ask um, why humans have so many diseases. Um, and we don't really have that many diseases. Chimps have a lot of diseases too and other, other primates, but we do have um, more diseases, slightly more because our population density allows the disease to go from person to person more easily. But a lot of the things we think of as, as diseases um, like, like heart disease and um, diabetes um, and cancer to a certain extent are things that our, that our hunter-gatherer ancestors didn't, didn't have to deal with. We have them because we have very rich diets and don't get, get much exercise. So not really that disease-ridden, but part of it is, is a, a consequence of our modern lifestyle, not of, of our, any attribute of our species in, in particular. So all these things um, can be things that we think that the paleontologists list as the most distinctive things about, about um, um, humans. Chimpanzees have something to say about them and understanding that web of relationships among those various um, traits helps us to, to sort this out. Thank you, Kenny, for in inviting me and thank you um, to, to the organization. And thank you for the chimpanzees for uh, providing all this, providing my career. I've been studying chimpanzees for over 30 years. So wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hunt. We have several really great questions. All but right. First, I just want to introduce the people to our TIES program just for a few minutes, and then I'm gonna direct all those questions to Dr. Hunt. All right, so the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science is here for teachers and it's made by teachers. Our website is tieseducation.org. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, and we have a brand new YouTube channel just started a couple months ago where we list all of our fantastic webinars, like the one tonight. Now, Dr. Hunt did mention something about bipedalism, and I wanted to, I put this in just now, because I wanted people to know that on February 28th, we are gonna have an entire webinar on the evolution of bipedalism, but we have some other really great webinars for this semester. Some of them occur during school hours, and all of these are deemed safe for children. So that means you can live stream them into your classroom if they're occurring during your school hours. And if they're not, you can get the recording on our Facebook page, our YouTube page, and then you can play them back or you can assign them as assignments for your middle school or high school students. All of our resources are free. We have hundreds of free animated videos, interactive labs, hands-on labs, PowerPoints, everything's free except for our book. And that is only because we had to print the book, which costs money. The book is called On Teaching Evolution. It includes hundreds of years of experience because we've interviewed more than a dozen teachers. They all wrote about their uh, firsthand experience in the classroom teaching evolution. So if you wanna support TIES, you can go over there and order our book and I will ship it to you. We're part of the Center for Inquiry, and we have two other uh, educational programs. One of them is called Young Skeptics, and this aims to develop and foster an understanding of the world through inquiry-based learning. So you can check that out. We have all of that is free for teachers to use. And then we also have Science Saves. And just like the other two, Ties and Young Skeptics, Science Save was created by teachers for teachers 
And these lessons promote the fact that thanks to science, our lives are better because recently science has been under attack. And we just need to make sure that everybody understands the scientific method. It's okay that scientists change their mind based on evidence. So we love science saves. Now we have this picture of two children blowing stuff up in these flasks. This is not what science looks like. It looks like Dr. Hunt going to Africa studying chimps. It looks like uh, children taking butterfly nets and looking at butterflies up close. It looks like geologist. So we want to banish this stereotype of an old white guy playing with a flask and blowing his hair off. And to do that, we have a $10,000 image contest. It is for children and college students. The deadline is approaching. The deadline is in February. Go to sciencesaves.org and then you can click the Science Saves Image Contest to learn more. And then we're gonna get rid of those two kids blowing stuff up and we're gonna use your image. So all the details are there and we just want to promote that gratitude, truth and hope. Science is good. Now, another part of Science Saves just like all of our other uh, resources, or we have elementary language arts, math, science. We have all those free uh, resources that are to your state standards, but we have a, another contest. This is for senior high schools, seniors and high schools, high school seniors. They're entering college. They need college money. We have multiple uh, awards. The first prize wins $10,000. The deadline is May 8th, 2023. And what they have to do is make a 30 second video on how science has improved their lives or someone else that they know. So the video could be about how they use insulin, if they have an artificial limb, about vaccinations. And all they have to do, make a little 30 second video, submit it, and they could win $10,000. And that's just for the first prize. We have uh, prizes the top five prizes, and the money, they can use it forever they want. They can use it to get to college. They can put it in a mutual fund. They can use it to buy food. They can use it to buy books. It's cash money that they can use for their college education. All right, so I know you guys attending live. Thank you so much. You typed in your questions, but something else that I just added was 14 years ago, I went to Costa Rica to study primates with Kim Dingus. And now, 14 years later, instead of uh, Costa Rica, in addition to Costa Rica, she is also going to Uganda. So I just put that in there. If you are a college student and you have little to no field experience, but you want some, email Kim and she will hook you up with all of her great sustainability, primatology, and uh, I think she also does birds and insects and she has lots of great courses. So I just want to put that out there because I thoroughly enjoyed it many, many years ago. All right, Dr. Hunt, we got a couple of questions for you. Now, just a reminder, this is mostly, it's definitely mostly for middle school and high school teachers, but they're sharing it with their students. So Dr. Hunt, what do you suggest a young person to do or pursue if they want to do a similar career, what experiences do they need? What degrees do they need to study primates or animals in general? Um, it, it, you just talked about Kim's field school. Um, one of the, the greatest experiences you, you can have is to, to go to a field school. I recommend that to anyone who's, who's seriously considering primatology as a, as a career. So Kenny, you've been to a, to a field school and um, you know your, from your own experience that that there are challenges that you can't even imagine. You know, it's it's humid, it's hot, it's dirty, it's difficult to follow primates. Your neck gets sore with binoculars in the air, and your binoculars up in the air, and a bird poops in your mouth. And you know, there's there's all sorts of things you never expect are are, are going to happen. Um, so experiencing that in in the field and seeing if that still is something that's desirable to you is is helpful. But it also gives you a foundation of skills that. That if you see a job that that looks like it might be appealing to you as a field assistant, you can you can apply for that. So, um, but a, as a career, I entered this career. Um, I, I sort of backed into primatology. 
I wanted to study the evolution of bipedalism and I thought I could do it in the lab, um, but there was no data on chimpanzee bipedalism at, at that time. And I kept begging other people to gather data for me. And my advisor said, you're not gonna get anybody to gather your data. You need to go study the chimpanzees yourself. Um, and so I, I ended up doing that. So I was getting a, a human paleontology, human evolution degree at the time. A lot of times, human evolution programs were in anthropology. Increasingly, they're sort of budding off on their own and, and being either their own departments or a special part of anthropology. But anthropology or human paleontology, human evolution, paleoanthropology, they sometimes call it, that's the, the place to go if you, if you want to study primates and apply it to paleo. If you just want to study primates and you're not interested in the, the paleo aspect of it, primatology, again, is, is mostly in anthropology, but you see it sometimes in psychology and um, in biology. So getting a, a psychology or a biology degree or more likely an anthropology degree and taking all of the, the classes you can um, is, is the way to go. There are fewer people trying to do this than you think. And it's because it's because once you go and see how hard the work is and, and how, how many other things distract you from, from actually watching the primates, you know, you're, field assistant doesn't show up for work that day or, you know, the, the vehicle breaks down and there's no food in camp and you've got to hitchhike into to town and um, all of those things sometimes deter people. So it's it's good to to start out with some field work and then and take class work and then then get another experience and see if it's good for you. Very good. Just briefly, I, I remember vividly 14 years ago, I came home from Costa Rica with my eco-friendly shampoo you know, biodegradable shampoo. And my parents said, what is that? And they looked inside and there was a dead spider about three inches across inside my shampoo bottle. <laughs> All right. Well, that's I'm gonna... probably quite illegal to export animals from Costa Rica. <laughs> oh, I... Yeah, the biosecurity measures were different, I guess. All right, I'm going to skip around. How many researchers, because you mentioned this, how many researchers across the world do you think exclusively study chimps or study them in an in-depth way? Well, I, I have some information on that in my book. Over the history of primatology, there have been about 120 um, different, different field sites, but the vast majority of those, maybe 80, are, are no longer in effect. So there are about 40 sites where, where people are working and it tends to be, I mean, they, so, so how do you define research or if you define the people who, who are hired, um, who, who probably don't have a college degree and are, are just meant to go and collect um, leaves um, that, that day and they have a very specific job or they're, they're cutting the trails to make sure that people can get to the um, primates easily, um, that would expand it greatly. But as far as people who are publishing papers on at, at each of these 40 sites, you might have two or three um, people working. So around 100 people who are actively doing field work, I think it's, is a pretty good estimate. And if you're a student who wants to go into college, so that means you have about 100 advisors <laughs> that you could, that you could uh, choose from? Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Oh, some of those people are, are doctoral students just getting their degree. Um, some are, are, are people who are just collaborating and so they, they don't actively work year round. So I would say there are probably more like 50 um, people that you could work under if, if you wanted to get a doctorate or, or an advanced degree, other advanced degree. Um, we, we kind of talked a little bit about this before the recording. Can you share how many times have you been to Africa and maybe your calendar or, or what you, how often you wish you could go and study them? I, I spent, I added it up just a couple of years ago. I spent a total of three years sitting with chimpanzees. Um, it's, it's a long time. Most of that came during my dissertation year when every day I was going out and, and seeing chimpanzees. I've, I've probably, I've, I've been doing this um, since 1986. And um, so I, I've probably been to Africa about 50 times total. Um, sometimes I go twice a year. Um, sometimes early on, I was going three times a, a year when I was in my postdoc. Um, and I nowadays, 
um, for the past 25 years that I've been going to Simliki, I go almost all the time once a year and I go for about two months in, in the summer. So I finish teaching, it's, it's, uh, it's challenging because I finish teaching, turn in my grades, um, get, get to know my wife a little better and my kids a little better, uh, now they're grown, but, um, and, and you know, interact with my friends and then I'm immediately off to Uganda um, and then I come back and I, I have just a couple of weeks before I start teaching again. So, so it's a challenge. And when I go over spring break or Christmas break, it's the, the whole year is just running in place. So I, I try not to do that too much. So you talked about it and it's kind of well known that chimpanzees can be very aggressive. Can you just tell us your personal experience or maybe like an anecdote about when you've seen chimpanzees fancy aggression, but also maybe some chimp empathy or kindness that was, that was really surprising? Well, our, our chimps are, let me start with the empathy and say that within a community, chimpanzees are, are quite empathetic, um, especially close individuals that form close friendships. They help one another. Um, Jane Goodall has, in, if, you, if you look at her film Among the Chimpanzees, there one chimp that, that fell ill of polio and another chimp just sat right next to him for days, um, going off sometimes and feeding a little bit and then coming back and sort of sitting at the bedside of a dying um, individual. So there's a lot of empathy, not as much as with humans, I don't think, um, but there's still a lot of empathy within a, a community. It's when they're outside community that, that they're very violent. So I count it as a bit of a blessing that I've never seen a chimpanzee kill another chimpanzee. I've seen chimps kill monkeys, which is bad enough, um, almost as, as bad. Um, but but um, these attacks go on. And when, when a chimp kills a monkey, they grab the monkey and it, it, they kill it pretty quickly. Um, so it's awful for those, those seconds or minutes. But for these other attacks between chimps, they go on for many um, minutes. So I've seen attacks, but the, the chimp that was attacked always managed to get away. Um, and I was sort of cheering for them, yay, <laughs> even though my chimps were the ones that would suffer, the ones in my, the community I studied. So um, I've not e experienced much violence at, at all um, I, from, from chimpanzees. So in the wild, when you're studying wild chimpanzees, they don't think of you as a chimpanzee and they're most aggressive toward chimps and you're not trying to, to manipulate them in, in any way. So they come to just ignore you. Um, one time, um, goblin chimpanzee, I was, I was following some chimps and I was on a trail and um, I was following a chimp that was going away from me and there was another chimp I saw coming up the trail in the opposite direction. And I stopped and put my foot on a log that was across the trail and was taking notes. And then I felt this prod on my leg and I looked down and it was a chimpanzee and I thought, what does he want? And then he poked me pretty forcefully um, and I stepped aside and he just kept going down the trail. He was the alpha male of the group. And he was just telling me, look, I'm king of this world. This is my trail. You get out of my way. Um, so I've had a couple of pokes like that, but I've never really had um, aggression. In captivity, though, and especially when kept as pets, chimps are a little confused. They're out of their normal habitat. They don't know who their enemy is and who their friend is. And because they're fearful of strangers, Within a community, they know everybody. And when they go to attack these individuals, it's a very specific event. But for captive chimpanzees, they're, they're seeing these strangers all the time and they're in a highly agitated state for most of their lives. That's why they're so stressed out and, and die early. So then they're likely to attack any human they don't know. And if, if, you're, if you have a strong stomach, you can Google chimpanzee attack on, on Google images and you'll see people who have been grievously wounded um, by, by chimpanzees, horrible wounds. And every, every year, two or three babies are killed in Uganda by, by chimpanzees, people who, who don't know or who are willing to take the risk and they go into an area with chimps with a baby. And that's, that's not a good idea. So um, I've not seen, I, I've seen chimp violence toward monkeys a lot. I've seen some attacks, but I'm, I'm glad to say I've never seen a chimpanzee killed. All right, so we have a couple more questions and just a reminder for those attending live, I put Dr. Kevin Hunt's book link in the chat box. But if you have more questions, type them in there. 
Uh, somebody wants to know, is it our evolution adaptation for humans to have to eat spinach and green beans and other cellulose rich material compared to a chimp that are just eating soft fruits and monkeys and? Yeah, well, chimps, uh, un, so they, they have to have ripe fruit, but they can't get it all the time. And so they end up eating things with, they actually do eat a lot of fiber, um, but they don't want to. They're always trying to exclude fiber from, from their, their diet. Um, but when they don't have ripe fruit, they're, they're eating grass stems, which taste a lot like celery and leaves that are like spinach and, and, and so on. So they are getting a lot of, a, a lot of cellulose. Our, the reason our bodies don't react to a, a diet that, that lacks cellulose is in our evolutionary history, when we were hunter gatherers, we were getting a lot of fiber as well. We were trying to eat just sugary things and oily things and, and meat, but we ended up eating a lot. So you look at a diet of a hunter gatherer and it's 85% it's you know, vegetal matter. Um, so we, in our evolutionary past, we got a lot of cellulose and that means our bodies aren't evolved to exist without that cellulose. So it, that's true at a, at, at a molecular level when we have too high a sugar and not enough, enough fiber or cellulose to, to, to buffer that. But I can give you an example of, of something that's very physical that's easy to, to imagine. Your gut is much like the other muscles in your body and it needs to be exercised. So if you don't eat fiber, which is bulky, um, and, and exercise your gut by pushing that fiber through your small intestine and your colon, the muscles in, in your gut tend to atrophy. And then the walls of the, the gut tend to atrophy. And then when you eat something that's very dense and your intestines are trying to push it along, it can, the intestines can bubble out um, because the, the walls are weak. And if that bursts, you're in very desperate um, trouble. But um, you, you can get polyps and these, the, these are called diverticuli, these bubbles. Um, and it's a very common thing in the, in the human gut. That's because we're not evolved to not have fiber, even though we're evolved to try to avoid it. In our past, we weren't able to do it. It's sort of complicated. That reminds me of another webinar coming up called Evolution Gone Wrong. Oh, I just wanna say, looking at those talks, you have a wonderful lineup. Huh? Some of these people I'm I'm familiar with, and and I just just fantastic. I'm I'm sure you're um, all those who attend those talks are going to have a wonderful time. All right, we have, thank you for that. We have two more questions. This is from Jeremy. Hi, Kevin. Awesome talk. One question: Given all of the contributions to evolving big brains, do you have an opinion on what the most important factor is? Is it antifetent intolerance primarily? or large body size that mostly drives the large brain evolution? And then the follow-up is, is there a pattern with brain size, birth size, and the current size of the chimp? Brain size and birth size. So, so um, newborn infants, so, so let me answer that first. Um, there's a, primates only know one way to get a big brain, and that's to be born with a big brain. So there are some other animals that have solved that equation, but it must require a very complicated adaptation, specific mutations, and other physiological compromises that primates have not, have not done. So there is a connection between brain size at birth, if that's what this person is asking, and, and the, the brain size of, of uh, adults. So what, what is probably the most Im important, it, I mean, both of those things are so important. You're not going to have a brain the size of an orange if your, your body is, is the size of a mouse. Um, your body just, just can't support it. So um, large body size is necessary, but then being able to provide that energy for that brain is essential. So I would say that's more important. And in fact, even among humans, it's a very interesting phenomenon. Um, during times, the body seems to devote energy to to either growing the body or growing the brain. So when the brain's growing fastest in kids, you know, two and three years old, their, their stature isn't changing or, and body weight is not changing um, very much. And then when the brain slows down a bit, then they, they, their stature and body weight uh, goes up. So it's clear that it's very difficult to provide the energy that it takes to grow that brain. 
At the same time, I mean, brains use a lot of energy. 20% of our, our, our budget, energy budget goes to our brain. So if you're growing a big brain, especially if you're a little two-year-old kid with a huge brain in relation to their body weight, you're having to provide all that energy to run the brain and then extra energy to grow it. And then you've got other things you need to run around and play and learn about the world. So it's it, the energy is just a really strong constraint on how big brains brains can get. All right, thank you, Dr. Kevin Hunt. And thank you everyone who attended this live. And we appreciate it. Stay tuned for more TIES webinars. And thank you, Kevin, and everyone else. Have a good night. You're very welcome. Wonderful to meet you, Kenny. And thank you for organizing this. I appreciate it. And I hope to see you in Uganda one day. Yes, wonderful. That would be fantastic. Bye, everyone. Bye.